Today, I want to build on the things we talked about previously uh, to talk about hypothesis testing. In many ways, I'm covering a lot of material quite quickly because I want to cover these basics so we can then get on to lots of practice uh, for the latter half of, of the course. So um, I would advise you, if, if one, if you're confused about anything, please post a question on the blog. Or if you don't want to, if you feel uncomfortable posting a question on the blog, please email me and I will anonymously copy your question and put it on the blog. But it's for everyone, to everyone's advantage. Um, that, because it, it's quite possible that if you ask a question, many, many other people will have the same question. And so uh, it doesn't seem much point to me in, in working w with one group of people to answer a question that actually everyone wants the answer to. So any confusion, even, even the use of terminology, um, words that I may use, ter terms of phrase that I may use, please just ask. Otherwise, I won't know what to address, and I'll carry on as if everything's fine. Okay, um, for those of you who were here, here last week, you'll remember that I introduced some of these statistical ideas in um, the context of Star Wars. And I know for some of you, Star Wars, Star Wars will very much be uh, alien to you. For others, it will have been a staple as you were growing up. However, if you look past uh, the Star Wars side of it, the fundamentals of what we're talking about are um, unchanged. The Star Wars aspect is not essential to the understanding of the statistics. But I suggested that um, we landed on a new planet and then we wanted to find something out about the characteristics of its population. Now, although we're talking here about uh, finding out about human population, in fact, the basics uh, of what we're doing here, measuring something, that population doesn't have to be people in a population. It could be a population of measurements of, I don't know, DNA or, or, or anything. So just because I've talked about people, the principles that we're covering really apply to any kind of experimental um, science that we could do. So anyway, we... we we sampled the population because we wanted to find something out about the population at large. But of course, we didn't, we possibly couldn't go out and measure everyone in the population. So taking a sample of them allowed us to infer something about, um, about the whole population. And so we started this um, basic idea of exploring the data, visualizing it in terms of a histogram, and right, uh, exploring it in terms of a frequency table. And for those of you who've been following the course online, you'll see that I put up uh, a couple of videos that show how to create these frequency tables and histograms in SPSS. And again, if you're struggling with it with following any of this, I would advise you to watch those videos and practice, uh, practice doing it. SPSS now does work on these machines. Um, and in fact, while I'm speaking, it might be worth just logging in and open, opening, it up, uh, opening it up, because it takes a little while. So when we get on to using it, um, at least it should have opened by then. So anyway, we, the first thing that we do is just look at the data and explore what it looks like, um, and just get a feel for its characteristics. And then I talked about the normal distribution, something that underlies much of um, certainly conventional statistics, and understanding it is extremely useful when it comes to understanding um, probabilities and, uh, and p-values. And so we define the normal distribution in terms of the standard deviation. The standard deviation is just something that we calculate that tells us something about the spread of data. 
that tells you about something to do with the range and the spread of values that we might have in our data. And under the normal distribution, it actually means something quantitatively. And it means that within one standard deviation of the mean, we have 68% of the data. So um, the mean, like I said, mu, call it sometimes, um, and, and in normal distribution, the mean is in the center of the distribution, and it's um, symmetric. And then we have one sigma, that's one standard deviation, either side of that, accommodates 68% of all of the uh, measured values. And then we talked about how, under the normal distribution, 95% of all of our data would exist uh, within two standard deviations of the mean. So it's two standard deviations each side of the mean. And this is really just a way of characterizing what the, no the properties of the normal distribution. And likewise, you go to three sigma, and you have 97 or 99.7% of the data. So this is what we, we looked at last week. And then we applied this, uh, this idea to these things called confidence intervals uh, that we, uh, uh, I put here, that uh, we use confidence intervals to estimate the probability that the sample mean represents the popula population mean. So remember, we're taking a sample of data, and the reason we take a sample is because we want to learn something about the whole population. And so then it's reasonable to ask ourselves, how representative is our sample of that population? And the confidence interval allows us to assign a number to how confident we are that our mean of our population, of our sample rather, represents um, the mean of the population. The confidence interval itself is uh, is an estimate of the standard deviation of many um, sample means. There you go, I've written it at the bottom. Standard error of the mean is an estimate of the standard deviation of the means of lots of different samples. And in fact, under the central limit theorem, the regardless of the underlying um, distribution of the population. So the, the popula population may not have a normal distribution, but if you take lots of samples, the means will end up follow, following or approximating a normal distribution. So that's why we can s state a 95% confidence interval, and it still means something even if the population um, distribution isn't normal. And then we got on to p-values, and I introduced this as the probability that an observed result could be obtained by chance. Uh, and you can more formally state this as the likelihood of obtaining the observed result if the null hypothesis is correct. And back in the first lecture, I briefly mentioned uh, the terminology null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis. But given that today's subject is about hypothesis se uh, testing, um, I thought that perhaps we should run back over that again and refresh our memories as to what these hypotheses are. So what we're going to cover today is null and alternative hypotheses. So we just refresh our memory of those. Uh, statistical significance, effect size, and statistical comparison. So these are terms that pop up quite a lot in the literature, and um, it's, it's quite important that we understand what this terminology means so that we can discuss our data using these standard formalisms. So firstly, we have our hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is the no-difference hypothesis. So let's say we're comparing two things 
The null hypothesis is simply that there is no difference between the thing that we're measuring and a reference. Or there's no difference between two things that we're measuring. That's the null hypothesis. So it's null because there's nothing, no effect. And then we can um, suggest an alternative hypothesis in the case in the case that the null hypothesis doesn't explain our data set or our measurements, then the alternative, we, we would have to come up with an alternative hypothesis. And so this can be, um, there is a difference, as simple as that. Or it can be that the thing being measured is less than some reference or that the thing being measured is greater than some reference. So you can have a directional element to it. So rejection of the null the so rejection of there being um, the idea that there's no difference between two things doesn't automatically mean that we adopt our alternative hypothesis because it depends what our alternative hypothesis is. So just to reiterate, having just briefly looked at that again, that the p-value is the likelihood of obtaining the observed result if the null hypothesis is correct. So if there's actually no difference, um, what's the likelihood that we would get the results that we got in our experimental measurements? <coughs>